Hare Krishna. So thank you very much for coming today evening. And when I heard the rousing Kirtan going on, I felt like this class would be an interruption to that Kirtan. It is very powerful and very sweet Kirtan. You can see that all of you have found spiritual taste in Krishna's holy names, especially through Kirtans. So I'll speak today on a topic which I have seen in universities in America, some of the best universities. I spoke in Massachusetts, Harvard. Most of the time I, I used to speak on topics like science and spirituality, where I try to explain scientifically how spirituality is valid and valuable. However, after that, most of the questions that come are about insecurities. And most insecurities are about the future, <coughs> about the future and about Hare Krishna and about relationships. So I'll speak on dealing with the fear of rejection and dealing with the fear of rejection. If we study the recent history and look at fears that people have had, what are the prominent 10 fears of people in the 18th century? 10 fears in the 19th century, 10 fears in the 20th century, and 10 fears in the 21st century. So they found that two new fears have been have come up in this list in the 21st century. One of them is the fear of terrorists. Uh, the second is the fear of rejection. Rejection means that people, everybody wants a sense of belonging. Rejection specifically refers to when people want to form a relationship, say a man, a boy and a girl want to form a relationship. But it is not just that. It is we all want a sense of belonging. We all want a sense of acceptance. We all want to feel wanted. And if we don't get that, then we can feel very lonely, we can feel very unloved and then that can lead to a lot of problems. So we all want a sense of belonging and we fear that when we try to belong, try to enter into a particular group, if we are not accepted, we are rejected, that hurts us terribly. If you go into a college, you go into a, if you move from one place to another, or you go from one school to another school, one co school, a school to a college, and then you want to have some friends over there. And if there is, in every place if you go, there is an established circle of people, and then maybe there is some club, there is some forum, and we want to join that club. So how many of you have felt this fear? That if I want to join a club and I am not accepted. Have any of you felt this any time? Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. I think those of you who are not raising your hearts are afraid of, are fearing at admitting it also. <laughs> no. If you have not never felt that fear, that's, that's fortunate. Not necessarily. Uh, I'll talk about that. There are certain fears that are healthy fears. Just like if you put our hand in the fire and we get burnt once. And then after that, oh, I'll never put my hand in the fire. So next time when you see fire, we move away from it. But well, that is a healthy fear. So for all of us, the sense of belonging is vital. And I will talk about this through a character in the Mahabharata. And how his unfulfilled need for belonging made him do unsavory things, even unholy things. And that character is, can you guess anyone? Karana. Karana. Oh, wonderful. So we are all on the same track at the end. Karana is a, is a heroic and tragic character. 
<coughs> in the Mahabharata. He his entry in the Mahabharata happens when Drona students are graduating from the academy. It is a time when they have all learned their archery skills and they are exhibiting those skills. And at that time, Arjun exhibits his skills so fearlessly that fearlessly and peerlessly. Without fear, and there is no peer, no one equal to him. And then, when everybody is applauding, there is one person whose heart is burning. Can you guess? Duryodhan. Karana is not yet entered till now. Duryodhana is saying, how dare? I, I deserved all this honor. I was the prince, heir apparent. I was supposed to become the king. <clears throat> because the Pandavas had lived in the forest initially. So initially only Duryodhana was there in the kingdom along with his brothers. And everybody used to pam pamper Duryodhana. Because he was expected to become the next king. And suddenly the Pandavas came back and the Pandavas were sweet, cultured, respectful and everybody started paying attention to them. Sometimes it happens in the family, if you are the only child for a long time, you are the center of attention of your parents and then you have a brother or a sister. On one side you are happy you have brother and sister, but suddenly you find that this, you get very little attention. So like that, something similar happened to him and he was feeling very jealous. And he just wanted a foil. Somebody who could counter Karana, who could counter Arjun. And at that time, suddenly, at the gate of that arena where the exhibition was going on, there a powerful figure appeared. And he said, All that Partha has done, I can do it better. And he marched in thunderous foot claps and then he just bowed down to uh, Drona cursorily and he says, am I allowed to participate here? I will do better than what Arjun has done. And then nodded and he was allowed. And he started competing and he equaled Arjun. He didn't excel Arjun. Although he tried, he equaled everything that Arjun did. And when he realized that he had not excelled Arjun, he said, I desire a duel with Arjun. So Arjun immediately grabbed his bow. Yes, I will show him his place. But at that time, the question came up, okay, who are you? What are your antecedents? So if there is a particular school, and in that school, it is there is a graduation ceremony for that school. And say if you are in a particular singing, if there is a singing school and you have learned singing over there or music over there and the students are graduating over there and suddenly somebody else comes up and says, I can do better than all of you. Well, okay, you, even if you are better, this is a graduation ceremony for students of this school. So he was a gate crasher over there. Mm -hmm. Now, they said, who are you? So, who, what are your antecedents? Where have you graduated? Like a student might be asked, where have you graduated from? So he asked, at that time the antecedents were, okay, which dynasty do you come from? And his head fell on the ground, his head fell downwards. It was clear that he was not from a royal dynasty. And as Duryodhan was observing all this, he noticed an opportunity. Here it is. And immediately he gave a speech. He said, did you not see his skill, his caliber? How can he not be from a royal family? He must be. And even if he is not, I will grant him royalty. And he immediately made him the king of Anga. Yes. That is interesting over here. Often Duryodhan is uh, here glorified as the champion of the underdog. So Karana is like the underdog. Have you heard this word underdog? Okay. Mm. Some of you boys may have heard it. It's used in sports. That means if, a if there are two players competing, that one player the is very unknown and the odds are very much against that person. And the other person is highly favored, well known, celebrated. So the person who is a challenger is called the underdog. 
so he was the underdog and he he is considered champ, uh, duryodhan he supported karna he was so good at that but actually duryodhan had his ulterior agenda and he wanted a foil for arjun now duryodhan is a pol politician and politicians are expert at one thing at speaking it said that before the elections politicians shake your hand and after that they shake your heart <laughs> they shake your confidence they shake your faith politicians are so expert at speaking that they can describe hell so wonderfully that we look forward to the ride to hell so so what did duryodhan do he said i will make you the king now interestingly first of all for duryodhan to make someone the king did he have the authority he was not the king he was just one prince among many princes and he had no right over the kingdom but when it came to charity charity was considered to be a very honorable thing for kshatriyas to do and therefore for kshatriyas at that particular point the panda was also felt when he is giving charity duryodhan is giving charity then it's a matter of the honor of our dynasty if we say that he has no right to give charity like this because he did not have actually dhritarashtra was the king and dhritarashtra was also caretaker king when pandu had left so therefore but the panda was went along with that and karna felt so touched at that time he had felt this as a good about disrespected because i'm not being allowed to compete but now he is given me he has given me a sense of belonging and i belong to this elite circle of kshatriyas and if gratefully said oh duryodhan you have given me such an honor what can i do for you and duryodhan said i don't want anything from you except your friendship now this touched his heart so much he says that you will have till my dying breath that you will have throughout my life Now these words would come back to haunt Karna later. It's perfectly uh, understandable that Karna, at that time, felt so indebted to <clears throat> to Duryodhan, and even after that, although he became the king, there were times when he was derided, he was mocked, he was disrespected by being referred to. as what chariot chariot, chariot, chariot driver son is what is the sanskrit word for that suta suta putra or suta so now there are times in our life when we feel ourselves very unfairly singled out you know in which dynasty someone is born that is not in their control at least from this life's perspective You can say we had done some karma in a previous life, but that's not in our hands. So it's it's very unfair. And at that time, when somebody is being disrespected like that, not being included in a group like that, it can hurt so much that a person can go to any extreme to somehow feel a sense of belonging. So he he was a person who. was throughout his life is characterized by this need for acceptance need for honor and it's a understandable human need we all have that need and as i said especially if we are mocked or rejected for something that is not in our control it makes us feel very helpless when i first read the mahabharat it was probably 35 or so years ago 35 more uh, maybe more than that i read this amar chitra katha that was there at that time then i saw on tv also so the character with whom i empathize the most 
was Kar. And whenever anybody would call him a Sut, I would feel so angry. Not just angry, I would feel hurt. Because when I was a child growing up, I had this polio. So many times, kids in my neighborhood would call me a cripple. And I would feel so hurt at that time. And it was, I could sense what Karana must have been going through. And then throughout after that, whenever I would read, I say, why is Karana being treated so unfairly? It's only years later when I read the Ramayana, or read the Mahabharata again, I, I understood one principle. It is, hurt people hurt people. People who are hurt, hurt others. So hurt people, hurt people. But when we are hurt, sometimes at that time we lose a sense of proportion. We lose a sense of perspective. And we may hurt someone much more. Say for example, we are standing and talking with someone. And somebody just comes and stamps on our foot. We will feel we will feel alarmed, we will feel pain and out of that pain we just push them. Now when we push them, we are hurt and if they push and they fall. So a hurt person hurts another person. So that is an abnormal reaction. So but if suppose somebody is hurt on their foot and then they push someone else and not only they push them but then they start kicking them and they pick up a stick and start beating them. That has become disproportionate. See that? When somebody is hurt in self-defense, to just push, even without the intention of hurting also is natural. But to deliberately go out and hurt the other person, that is too much. So this is what unfortunately happened to Karna. So there was another incident when Karna experienced this sting of rejection very painfully. Can you guess which was the incident? Yeah, sorry? Marriage. Yes. Dropadis Swayamvar. That is correct. It was the time when she got married. So now, this was a competition, this was, the Swayamvar was supposed to be a competition in which the best Kshatriyas would exhibit their skills so that they could get the hand of the bride. And often the bride and her father would have decided this is the prince we want to marry. And they would arrange the competition in such a way that it would be the competition would be in the area of the strength of that particular prince. So when they arrange this archery competition, you know what was the condition in archery? At what was the drop his hand? Yes. So look down and see the reflection of a fish, of a, a replica of a fish actually, which is there, up there, and there was a wheel. And through the wheel, you could see the, uh, the fish eye only momentarily. So look down, see the reflection, and when that fish eye is visible, shoot the arrow so that it will pierce through the spokes of the wheel and pierce the eye. So this required such super excellent archery skill that practically the only person who would have this was Arjun. And in fact when Drupad had done some yagya to get a daughter and a son, he had desired a daughter who would marry Arjun. So that was the reason why he had said this. Now all the princes tried and nobody could succeed. And then finally Karna came forward. And when Karna came forward, at that time, Drishtudyumna, who was Drishtudyumna? Yes, Draupadi's brother. So he said that, so Draupadi spoke something to him, and, she, and he said that, that, that a Suta cannot marry my sister. Now Karna felt infuriated by this. He felt deeply insulted. And yes, it was an insulting incident, no doubt. However, after some time, Duryodhan, uh, Arjun came over there. But that time, Arjun was not dressed like Arjun. He was dressed like whom? 
a brahmana so he was in, they were hiding at that time because the attempt to at their to burn them alive had been made in varanavart and from there they had fled so he was addressed as a brahmana and he came forwards and he said is a Bra first he looked forward to drupad and he said is a brahmana allowed to participate in this competition he asked the drishtadyumna and drishtadyumna looked at drupad now everybody was intrigued by this because all the kshatriyas had tried and nobody had succeeded and now it seemed as if the bride would go unwed and then he came so some of the kshatriyas started mocking they said this brahmana brahmana are meant to be sense controlled but seeing the beauty of draupadi this brahmana has lost his sense control has become maddened by desire he is simply a he is simply a mocker a mockery of a brahmana and then some brahmana said You, how can you do what a kshatriya would not do don't bring shame to the brahmanas by trying something like this some other brahmana said but you know, hey, just look at his physique he is strong and just see how he is marching forward like a lion you now these kshatriyas are so proud today one of us brahmanas will show how we are better than them even in their area of expertise so all these different voices were going on at that time and then drishtadeva turned to drupad and drupa looked curiously at this young man and he then said the brahmanas are always venerable for kshatriyas so brahmanas can participate and an arjun he went up to the bow picked up the bow in one moment and then he shot the arrow and met the target and he hit the target and there was stunned silence for one moment and then it is like say total overwhelming applause but not by the kshatriyas they <laughs> everybody else were come <laughs> the kshatriyas felt slighted what happened so the future incident we can go into but our thrust is over here this thing see arjun first asked can i compete karna never asked now karna knew fairly well that he did not he was not although he was a king he was not yet accepted by everyone as a person belonging to that kshatriya dynasty kshatriya circle so when he just presumed that he could compete and when he was stopped he felt insulted because the whole thing was terrible but to some extent he set himself up for that and he felt so angry at that time so on one side what happened the kshatriyas did not give him acceptance and duryodhan gave him acceptance so initially when duryodhan would yeah yeah he was originally kshatriya but at that time nobody knew because he was seen as born of a sutra so that was revealed only towards the end nobody knew at that time so now initially when duryodhan came up with various schemes so for example when he decided let's send to the pandavas to the forest and burn to to varanava then burn them alive karna said why do you have to do such things we have ability let challenge them to a war defeat them and send them to the forest so karna initial he had his values and he opposed duryodhan's devious ways his evil ways but over a period of time as karna started becoming more and more emotionally dependent on duryodhan he wanted acceptance he feared rejection and that need for acceptance and that fear of rejection started making him do whatever it took to please duryodhan and thus he ended up casting aside his own values his own morals and this happened tragically in the worst possible way in the disrobing of draupadi 
I will come to that in a few minutes. But at this point, does anyone have any questions or comments? Yes. What stopped Kunti uh, Devi from re revealing any earlier that uh, a lot of these things could have been avoided? Okay. What stopped Kunti from revealing that Karana was her son? It's difficult for us to understand because we live in a very different culture. Hmm. In traditional cultures, a, wom a woman's chastity was considered to be her foremost virtue. Hmm. And for a woman, especially of a royal family, to have had a child before marriage, it was a matter of great disgrace. Mm. No, so, so she couldn't and she was basically a teenager when she had Karna. So she very well couldn't take care of Karna himself. And, she, and sometimes, she, sometimes people say she just abandoned him. But she didn't abandon him. She actually put him in a box with a lot of jewels and precious substances there. And then she put him in the river at a time when the river's current was going towards the opposite coast, opposite bank. So the putting their jewels meant that she wanted whoever would find the child could understand that this child is from an elite family, but they should take care of this child. And she also arranged that she didn't just put him in water. If she just wanted to abandon him, she could have eliminated him. But she put him in a careful wooden basket with jewels and the child was going away. She was tearfully offering her prayers. Oh, he looked up at the sun and offered prayers. You give this child, you please take care. She offered prayers to the wind. She offered prayers to the river goddess. Please take care of this child. Now when Karana came first in that assembly, Kunti was also there. And when Kunti saw Karana, she fainted. She fainted and Vidura was surprised. What happened to her? And then she came back to consciousness. And by the time she came back to consciousness, she could sense that this deep rivalry between Karna and Arjun had started. So after that, things just went out of control. And Karna, especially when Karna committed himself to the to Duryodhana's side, then things became even more complicated. So for her, her disgrace was the first fear. Second was that although she loved Karana, she also loved Arjuna. And when Karana and Arjuna's rivalry came up and further Karana committed himself to Duryodhana, that meant that if she claimed Karana as her own son, that would mean that all chaos would break apart in their family and eventually her hope was that there would be reconciliation although there was a rivalry so there is a rivalry and there is enmity hmm. say for example in sports if you consider cricket <coughs> India and Pakistan are rivals but on the war field at the border in Kashmir they are not just rivals they are not just rivalry there is enmity so, there was a rivalry between Karana and Arjun, but her hope was that it would be resolved and there will be uh, some amount of uh, resolution. But unfortunately, it worsened, worsened towards enmity. And eventually, she had to, eventually, she saw that he's going to die. That was the time she told him. And she realized that that's the only way to save Karana's life. But then, Karana didn't listen at that time. I'll come to that part later. But it's just that a very complex set of situations that emerged and especially in a society which is very conscious of uh, chastity, female chastity, it was very difficult for her to do it. Any other questions? Yes? Did Karana know that he was not the real son of Adiratha and Radhe? I would say yes. Yeah. So then why did he like say that? Mm -hmm. 
but he didn't know who sunny was it, it could even mean that uh, he was uh, anybody's child it, it all that it meant was that he was not their children see, see in traditional society traditional culture is very different from our culture today traditional culture a person's defining identity was their dynasty so although he did not he did not belong to kshatriya sutras were somewhere between kshatriyas and vaishyas see it was still respectable but not as respectable as kshatriyas but if he was considered not a son you are abandoned child who was adopted by sutras then that might mean he might be a shudra also he might be an outcast also there is no guarantee that he was a brahman or kshatriya so it is like we say there is a blind uncle is better than no uncle so having some parentage was better than having no parentage okay so let's move on now when draupadi when eventually the gambling match started so at that time because he didn't want to fight this to said to duryodhan he said why do you want to steal from me the wealth that i am using to serve dharma to serve the brahmanas to protect dharma he says we don't want to steal any wealth we just want to have a match and if you are afraid you need not fight you need not play now this was a word which a kshatriya could not bear if you are afraid so then he started playing and shakuni was a trained professional gamester gambler so actually it was a rigged match so sometimes say two kids in a in a in a locality they decide to have a wrestling match mm-hmm. who is a better wrestler and it's announced and both of them come together in wrestling match for the wrestling and then at the time of wrestling one kid gets mohammad ali over there to fight on his behalf now that will make it completely unfair so like that it is supposed to be a friendly gambling match between yudhishthir and duryodhan but suddenly he brought in shakuni and yudhishthir raised an objection he said that they should not this is against the rules of gambling he looked up at dhritarashtra but dhritarashtra remained silent and because of that yudhishthir couldn't do anything and they gambled and gambled and they lost everything he lost all his wealth he gambled and he lost himself lost his brothers he lost himself and then eventually he was goaded into gambling draupadi and when draupadi was lost at that time it is karna who suggested draupadi is now become our maid servant says bring her here and drag her into this assembly now at that time draupadi uh, was dressed in single cloth she had had her period and just got over she had taken a bath and she was just getting ready she was dragged through that itself and it was karna again who suggested she is a maid servant this over now this is and the kshatriya is meant to protect those who are weak but here he was violating and he was instigator and there was a serious dushasan to it now of course he couldn't succeed but this itself was terrible and then he just continued on eventually as things became worse and worse vikarna was one of the brothers of Duryodhan who had a conscience and he said stop this but then karna stopped him he said this is who you are as a child what do you know uh, i'm not going to, going to go into the details of the whole past time because our thrust is something different here so the point is later on when karna meets krishna and karna meets bhishma just before the kurukshetra war and during the kurukshetra war after bhishma falls both times karna express terrible regret he says during that gambling assembly i acted terribly 
because of my the desire to please desire to please duryodhan i suggested things that i regret so what happened here was that that this there was he had felt the sting of rejection from draupadi it's understandable and it was insulting for him but to dishonor and disrobe a honorable woman in public there is no sense of proportion over there like i said if somebody stamps on our foot and then we pick up a stick and start beating the person to death there's no proportion over there uh, one principle in justice is justice should be proportional to the crime done not proportional to the anger felt at the crime <laughs> so you can understand that karna felt very angry but for karna i was dishon you dishonored me that is not draupadi personally you dishonored her but you dishonored me so i will dishonor you now but there is no sense of proportion kshatriya not being allowed to compete in a gambling match and for a woman to be disrobed completely so what happened here was he ended up he was a good person who ended up becoming bad because of his wanting a sense of belonging in a bad circle he wanted a sense of belonging he got in a bad circle and he ended up becoming terrible so <clears throat> i've seen when indian students go to america at that time broadly they may follow three trajectories one of their first is that oh my parents have spent a lot of money i have to be responsible i have to study i have to i have to repay all work enough get a good enough job and uh, repay all those loans i have to study they just focus completely on studies and at one level it is good but they can become obsessive they can get completely stressed out and a little thing goes wrong they just get completely overwhelmed by that the other is that they feel oh my indian culture was so restrictive so many rules don't do this don't do this don't do this. now i am free and then they feel if they have that freedom they start doing anything and everything for tasting that freedom but the problem is that there was actually when people try to get pleasure through anything and everything the result is that all the things that promise pleasure the pleasure from them is limited the harvard medical school ha did a very well known paper a uh, research paper on the state of youth uh, in elite american universities and the whole idea was that in america there was something called the sexual revolution the sexual revolution was that that the free sex is the way to free love and the all moral restraints on sexual indulgence were removed and by that you can experience experience love you can experience joy you can experience connection you can be happy so there were these american kids who just did anything and everything but when they interviewed this harvard medical school article they interviewed them and then they found that most of these kids felt extremely lonely and extremely guilty why lonely and guilty because although physically they were free to do whatever they wanted but they knew that they were using others just to satisfy their itch and others were using them to satisfy their itch and their bodies came in contact with many other bodies but their hearts didn't come in contact with any other heart they were used and thrown used and thrown and this so the overall conclusion study was that this free sex revolution instead of increasing love ended up increasing loneliness cause it's a constant competition to attract attention and when somebody doesn't get attention i was in a american university and i was there on valentines day so i gave a talk over there and after that some students came and talk with me 
and they say uh, this valentine's day uh, is actually a day of not pleasure but great tension <laughs> why tension because the way the media has marketed it say that for for girls you know how many valentine day cards you get that becomes a prestige issue if you don't get any that means you are worthless and for a boys also that also becomes a tension okay this 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 okay whom should i give and will i be accepted or not will i be rejected what will happen so what is touted as a as a as a festival or a celebration or whatever for bonding it actually ends up creating enormous anxiety and tension and same way with many things so people end up doing more and more terrible things more and more sensual things more and more perverse things just to get a sense of belonging but actually they don't get belonging they only end up with longing more and more longing more and more dissatisfaction more and more loneliness loneliness is a big big problem and many of these young people when they grow up they just get so jaded jaded that many americans especially in america uh, there are um, among caucasians caucasians means people on americans europeans who came to america there are immigrants there are chinese there are indians but caucasians in many caucasian families or many caucasians uh, who are say in the age of 30 40 50 they they have more dogs than they have children <laughs> because this feeling of having a family having a child is such a big commitment in fact i saw there was one boy he was driving a car and behind his car he had written on a uh, car uh, like some people write something on the bumper of the car so he had written there the more i get to know people the more i love my dog <laughs> <laughs> so what happened is that when people start you simply using each other then they use each other and then throw each other and then people just end up feeling so lonely and then they just okay i want some connection so they end up lavishing all their love on their dogs in fact i met a devotee who is a psychologist okay psychology is a respectable profession but he is a psychologist for dogs <laughs> what do you mean psychologist for dogs so people feel depressed they go to psychologist to see a psychologist but now by associating with depressed people even dogs are getting depressed <laughs> <laughs> now whether the dogs are getting depressed or people are imagining that their dogs are depressed oh when i came today my dog did not bark and move his tail and welcome me <laughs> oh my dog must be depressed let's take him to doctor so people have started bonding with dogs so much have you heard of yoga all of you must have heard of yoga have you heard of doga <laughs> doga is a multi million dollar industry it is yoga with dogs <laughs> so people want to do everything with their dog so they, like you have various yoga asanas they have doga asanas <laughs> <laughs> doga asana means what are the asanas you can do with your dog so you you the, you heard the dogs for paw the dog holds your paw the dog holds your hand and then you do yoga asanas together <laughs> so just as there are yoga teacher there are doga teachers <laughs> you can search you can google on doga you'll see them entertaining photos also of doga so the point i'm making is all that is promised oh just just give up all rules just enjoy that's what the world and the culture allures us with way but that doesn't lead to any sense of belonging it only ends up leading to a greater and greater sense of loneliness so yes at one level we may feel that my i want to i want to belong i want to uh, have good friends 
I want to have good relationship. That's just a human need. But rather than thinking that we have to give up our values and principles so that we can belong, what we need to do is recognizing that there, recognize that there are certain circles that are worth belonging to and there are certain circles which are not really worth belonging to. It's not a disrespect to anyone. But we all want a social circle that will lift us up, not something that will drag us down. Not something that will drag us down. So if we have that kind of social circle which drags us down, then we may end up in a terrible situation. So when <clears throat> I met one boy in America, so when he he is not a devotee, his parents were nice, you could say pious Hindu people, and he started coming to a program. We had a bhakti yoga club in our university. He started coming there. And his parents became alarmed. He said, oh, if you go to ISKCON program, they will make you into Brahmachari. <laughs> so don't go to that program. And then he wanted to please his parents. So he didn't go for that program. Now, firstly, nobody can make anyone into a Brahmachari. Actually, even Krishna can't force anyone to do anything. See, Krishna couldn't pursue Duryodhana, Duryodhan to his priest proposal. So only if somebody is inspired, they can do that. And that is, that is a exaggerated fear. But anyway, what happened? He wanted a sense of belonging. And his parents told him, then go to the Bhakti Yoga Club. So he started hanging out with some other friends. And those friends went into drugs. And he took once, he took twice. Now, with respect to indulgence, it is such that drinks, is it's a smoking or drinking or drugs, it's such that, actually, it said that with respect to a drink, first the drink, first the drinker takes a drink. So the person alcoholic, person drinker takes a drink. Then the drink takes another drink. And then the drink takes the drinker. So people just get addicted, completely addicted. There's a British author who said that giving up smoking is the easiest thing in the world. I have done it over a hundred times. <laughs> so I gave up smoking, but smoking didn't give me up. What happens? Each time we indulge in something, between us and that object, an invisible rope is formed. So each time say somebody takes a drug, between that drug and that person, an invisible rope is formed. And then each time they drink again, and they take the drug again and again, and that rope becomes thicker and thicker and thicker. That person just feels pulled, just can't say no, just feel pulled overall. So what happened? He was told by his parents, don't go to the Bhakti Yoga Club. So he didn't go there, but then he ended up with this circle of people who were taking drugs. And then he ended up addicted. And eventually, he, his parents had sent him to do a lot of studies and with a bright future, but he was in a drug rehabilitation center. And then his parents met some devotees and they were regretting that if we had let him come to a devotee circle, he wouldn't have gone into this, could have been protected from it. So, so which circle we go into that can shape our whole future? Initially, it appears to be a small thing. It's like when we are on top of a, when there is a snowball. Have you seen snowballs? Not in the Middle East, I suppose. <laughs> but I was in Canada just like a few months ago. So we saw that the hills were filled with snow. Now when a snowball is formed, actually how it forms is interesting. In, on the top, it is just a snow pebble, tiny little pebble. And if a person sees that snow pebble moving down, they can just kick it with their foot. It will crack apart. But as it starts rolling down, 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 it starts gaining mass and gaining momentum. And by the time it has come down, 
that same person who with a just a flick of a toe could have cracked the snow pe pebble that snowball can bowl over that person knock him down crush him so that's what happens to desires initially when somebody does something let's eat this let's let's drink this let's smoke this let's take the shot let's watch this whatever now it's just like a snow pebble at that time it appears harmless but soon it gets the momentum of its own keeps getting stronger and stronger and stronger sometimes when we are in a particular social circle we may feel hey what's the big deal let's do it we do it but it doesn't just stay one thing it just keeps growing worse and worse and worse and this has karna completely ended up doing something which he bitterly regretted he said how could i have done that to how could i have spoken that how could i have suggested that how could i have watched by that happening how could i have instigated that so similarly once the once the need for belonging can make us do one thing another thing another thing another thing and just goes down 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 till a person get completely overwhelmed person can get ruined their lives by this so of course I don't want to end on a sober or a such a negative note. I'll conclude with a one anecdote which is much more positive. Oh, the first time when I went to America about a few years ago, several years ago, I had gone to a university, and I was speaking there on the topic of regulating our mental diet. By I was vegetarian society, I think just as we regulate the food that we eat, with the, what we feed to our body, we should regulate what we feed to our mind also. So after that talk, one boy, American boy, came and told me that just before this class, I was contemplating suicide. I was concerned. He said that I had been in a relationship with a girl, and she broke up with me. He said as I was gloomily just going along and wandering in the campus, I saw a note of this post, a poster of my program. He said now. I came here, and my whole class was about how our mind becomes conditioned. And when the mind becomes, that's when a person drinks first time, then the mind says, "Drink more, drink more, drink more." The mind has its own voice. So I said that the mind's voice can become stronger and stronger. So then, when I explained this to him, he said, "Now I understood. It is not I who wanted to commit suicide. It is my mind which is prompting me. Commit suicide, commit suicide, commit suicide." So I told him. that you have got a life saving insight now so i encourage you to uh, continue coming to the local bhakti yoga club and i also have a website online called geeta daily where i write every day a small article on the bhagavad gita about 300 words and along with that there's audio and a video also for those who prefer that so i encourage him to read that and then whenever i would go to america i would go to that university and I'd talk with him and he was growing nicely in his life and last year when i had gone there i met him again and he told me i had been in a similar situation so he had been i mean a study relationship with a girl and suddenly unilaterally she just broke up with me she said that i am blocking you don't try to contact me so he said i was so shocked he just went straight to his he was staying in a room he went to his room he went and locked the door closed the windows pulled down the curtains turned off the lights now most people after this what comes next people commit suicide i was in iit mumbai i was in iit kharagpur and there a professor had come and met me several you no know, iit what is iit one of the students over there has created a new full form for that it's an institute of infinite torture <laughs> <laughs> those who are there they sometimes feel so miserable anyway so what happened over there was that there are number of students who committed suicide and these are bright students and they all committed suicide in a particular way what they would do is 
they would close their doors and then they would stand on a chair and they'll put a rope around their neck and tie that rope to a fan and then use a stick to turn on the fan it's very painful but several students did like that it's a macabre way and somehow it caught so then the iit uh, the iit management had an emergency meeting so many students are committing suicide what to do and then immediately the instant approval they passed a proposal worth several lakhs replace all the fans with air conditioners <laughs> that's tragic actually it's, it's 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 ludicrous but the fans are not making people commit suicide <laughs> but somehow they just didn't know how to stop it so anyway this boy he just did the same he came in closed the door now when he had come to the bhakti vakal for the first time he he told me that he likes music he had his own violin so i encouraged him and the local bhakti vakal also encouraged him that he would in the kirtans he would play his violin and he would sing so at that time he just closed his door and then suddenly something from within him he just went and picked up his violin and then he started singing hari krishna just calling out and he told me just for 6 hours in the darkness of his room in privacy he was singing hari krishna low calling out to krishna and he said that time i felt the presence of krishna although it was dark i felt as if i was being bathed in some sublime light i felt <coughs> as if i was comforted blanketed by some sweet presence what could have been a very depressing experience for me it became one of the most enriching experiences of my life so this was how that not just the fear of rejection but the experience of rejection it led to the intensification of a spiritual connection he by his spiritual connection with krishna he was able to overcome mitigate that sting of rejection so if each one of us we try to connect with krishna connecting with krishna is not just a matter of doing a certain set of rituals it's a matter of experiencing the presence of krishna when we do that that will be our greatest strength krishna always loves us krishna is always there within our hearts even if people around us misunderstand us but still krishna always cares for us and that strength of our relationship with krishna can help us gain strength when our other relationships get disrupted we have a vertical relationship with krishna and we have horizontal relationship with others sometimes our horizontal relationships may get disrupted uh so if the horizontal relationship is all that we have then we will become devastated but if we have a vertical relationship with krishna that will give us a strength and by the strength of that relationship we can overcome whatever disruptions our horizontal relationship may go through that is the power of bhakti that the spiritual connection can help us deal with the fear of rejection and ultimately that spiritual if we stay connected with krishna krishna knows us krishna knows our needs and krishna will guide us to a social circle krishna will guide us to a relationship where our need for belonging our need for connection even at the horizontal level will be fulfilled so i'll summarize what i spoke today i spoke on the topic of overcome dealing with the fear of rejection started by talking about how the two of the fears that have entered in the top 10 list is fear of terrorists and fear of rejection and <clears throat> our sense of belonging the unmet need for belonging can make us do unsavory things talk about karna how his desire to be accepted and respected in the elite kshatriya circle made him a puppet in the hands of duryodhan and although he had his principles 
just to be, to be pleased to please Duryodhan and to be accepted by Duryodhan, he not only gave up his principles but he he indulged in terrible things which he himself regretted. Similarly, for all of us, we need a social circle, and if we don't get that, we can feel very insecure and lonely. But giving up our principles just to get a belonging to a social circle, that will only make things worse. I talked about this Harvard Medical School study that kids who in colleges who lived in this free sex revolution, they end revolution, they ended up extremely lonely. And that we are seeing today where people instead of forming relationships with other human beings, they are they're, they're so insecure, they are so unlonely, they are so lonely, they are so untrusting of each other that they just can't form relationships. And so they prefer having relationships with dogs. So even if we have to wait and be patient, rather than just trying to do anything and everything to belong to some circles, we try to find out that social circle which helps us rise, try to get a need for belonging and acceptance fulfilled in a horizontal circle, which is uplifting. And while that is happening for us to have patience and strength, we need a vertical connection with Krishna. So through the practice of bhakti, when we have that vertical connection, that will decrease our emotional neediness on others, the emotional dependence on others. And we will act not out of neediness, but out of maturity. And Krishna will in due course fulfill our emotional needs also. Our need for belonging, our need for connection will be fulfilled by Krishna if we make sure that we stay connected with Him. Thank you very much. Hare Krishna. Any questions or comments? Yes. You know, when a, when a speaker gives a class and there's no question, the speaker gets fear of rejection. <laughs> <laughs> yes, please go ahead. Sometimes we may have association, but even in association we may not, if somebody doesn't open up and talk about what issues they are facing, it becomes very difficult. How can we help them? Yes, see all of us keep the door of our heart very guarded. It's like if somebody is alone at home and they are living in a high crime area, if somebody knocks on the door then they may first, especially if it's a, it's a lone female, then they may first not look through the peephole. Then they may just, you know, if they have a door with a chain, they may keep the chain and they look out who is there. And if they find somebody is trustworthy, then they may open the door and uh, allow that person to come in. So similarly, when all of us, we keep our heart guarded, and sometimes we open the door of our heart, by speaking one statement, two statements, and then we see what is the response. If we are judged, hey, how can you do this? How can you think like this? What kind of devotee are you? Then we usually close down. So sometimes in our devotee community, we, instead of becoming more understanding, start becoming more judgmental. This is right, this is wrong. And how can you do like this? Actually speaking, our bhakti is meant to make us more understanding. 
because everybody goes through their struggles. Now, I may not have a particular problem, but somebody else may have a problem. Somebody may have anger issues. Somebody else may not have anger issues, but they may have envy. Somebody may not have envy, but they may have depression. So everybody can have different issues. So if people feel judged, they will not open up. So when somebody opens up a little bit, what is our response? We can tell people open up and uh, seek help or at least share your heart. But when people share their heart, what happens? If they are judged, if they are not understood, then they will not open up. So in general, we have to try to become less judgmental and more understanding. We are all having our struggles, different kinds of struggles. That's first thing. Second thing is that this is important. This is a big subject, but I'll mention briefly that I was at a addiction recovery program in America, in the Connecticut area. And there, this now addiction has become a big, big issue. It's a, it's an alarming, it's epidemic proportion. It's a, it's a issue of, uh, it's a national emergency. The American president declared it recently. Drug addiction. So now, in the Western world, Netherlands is the country which has had the maximum success in dealing with addiction. And what did they do in 2000? they had alarming proportion of addictions. Now, in, by 2018, they had the least addiction in Europe and most of the Western world is studying their model. So, what they did was that earlier, anybody was peddling drugs, anybody was taking drugs, everybody was treated as a criminal and they were punished. There is one way of dealing with it. But then, they stopped criminalizing the consumption of drugs and all the money that was saved they use that for rehabilitating drug users. So now if somebody is a drug user, at that time, they, if somebody is labeled as a drug user, a drug addict, nobody even wants to employ them. Of course, you may, you may do something under drug addiction, influence or you may influence other people. So they decided, they, the government told the employees that, employers, that if you employ this person who is trying to recover from drugs, then we will pay half the salary. So basically, they use all the money to integrate the drug users into society and to rehabilitate them. And by that, they found that once the drug users started having a life worth living, once they start feeling that, yes, I can do something constructive in my life, then the drug use just went down. So, the current insight is that the cure for addiction is not self-control. The cure for addiction is connection. Self-control of course required, but self-control comes by connection. So, if we, we are all alone fighting our battles, whatever it is, and it's a very difficult battle to fight alone, but if we are connected with others, it becomes easier to fight the battle. So both ways, if we are not judgmental and if you also educate that connection helps us in overcoming our issues, then it becomes easier for people to open up. Okay? Thank you. Any other questions? Okay. Um, I am continuing my final year of school, so this will be related to that. Um, now school is a place where we get materially educated and we meet a lot of people of different kind of face background and most of the people I have seen are multi face most of my friends, most of my classmates or anybody who I meet. So how can we deal with such people in our school life in a pious and healthy way and not offend them in any way okay. because mostly if you see materialistic people they get offended by someone who is too nice or somebody who is too pious. Okay. Yeah. So if we people with meet people in our colleges, schools where they are multi-phased and if they if they find somebody is too pious or too nice, they feel a little, they, they don't want to connect with such a person so much. Yes, that happens if we don't present our spirituality, our principles appropriately. 
I say that the three ways in which you can share our principles. I call it prescriptive, normative and descriptive. Say if somebody says, why don't you eat meat? And then if we start saying, oh, those who eat meat, they make their stomachs into graveyards of dead animals' corpses. So that is, we are prescribing, you should not eat meat. If you eat meat, you are a terrible person. Prescriptive is, we, we prescribe, like a doctor prescribing. Normative, this is right, this is wrong. Meat eating is such a terrible activity. Hmm. But descriptive is, this is what I do and this is why I do it. Say, actually, you know, I came to know how much pain the animals go through when they are killed. I saw some videos. Anybody, if anybody who is eating meat, if they then there's a video called Meet Your Meat. Have you seen it? Yeah. Some of you, it's, a, it's, it's quite a painful video to see. So if you are, uh, if you are a little emotional, don't see it also. But you can tell your friends to see it. You know, if you see the extent of pain the animals go through, then, I say, uh, yeah, then you say that you know, I came to know about the health benefits of vegetarianism. I came to know about um, how much pain the animals go through when they are killed. And therefore, I felt that I don't want, uh, there is no need for me to eat meat. So here what we are doing, we are not intruding in their space. So in general, if you give people their space, they will give us our space. But if we start intruding in their space, then it becomes a problem. So even our spiritual practices, if we present them, in not, we don't make people feel bad for not doing what we are doing. If we just accept this is how I, this is what I do, and this is why I do it, then it's fine. It doesn't uh, it doesn't have to off alienate or offend people. It's only when we take a holier than thou attitude, then people feel offended. I was in Texas, and uh, Texas is a Bible Belt state in America. There are many aggressive Christians over there who go out and they say surrender to Jesus or you will go to hell. Some people, some fanatical religionists, they also say, not only are you going to go to hell, we will help you get there faster. <laughs> so anyway, so there I saw one person had put in their car, car bumper a slogan. Said, oh God, please save me from your preachers. <laughs> then how, what had happened? People just feel so alienated. I don't want to. So you, you tell me, don't do this, do this, do this. So if it's like that, we don't have to be like that. We just present our principles in a descriptive way and people will accept. Okay? Thank you. Hare Krishna. So, shall we stop here? Are there any other questions? Anything from the Matajis? So, thank you very much. Yeah, please. If somebody is getting into smoking or drinking, how can we help them to get out? Yeah. First principle is that we cannot help anyone who doesn't want to be helped. Mm. It's, it's just we have to be clear that it's not our failure if we are not able to help someone. It's a simple example I give is that, say sometimes if a person is trying to drive a car, and sometimes in India it happens that you start try to drive a car and the car doesn't start itself. Then some neighboring people come along and they all push the car. So the person tries to drive the car, moving the gears and moving the steering wheel, and people from outside push the car, and together they are able to get the car on board. But suppose the people from outside are pushing, but the person inside has gone to sleep. <laughs> Or worse still, the person inside is pressing the brakes. <laughs> then those pushing outside is useless. Or sometimes some people, they just too hooked to it. That they just they don't want to give it up. So at that time, 
or what we can do is just keep a friendly relationship with them sometimes some people have to go through the school of hard knocks they have to experience the consequences of certain actions then they may become more receptive to understand if you can somebody can learn just by explaining and observing others that's best but some people can't that doesn't make them bad people that just makes them that they're not receptive at that time so if you just mention maintain a nice relationship with them and even such people go through introspective moments they go to, what am i doing with my life there's some time when they realize actually i'm trapped i remember i, I when i was talking about mental health i read a book like a bi- autobiography of an addict of alcoholic so he wrote of how he was in america in not in the eastern eastern part of america which is very cold so one night late in the night he got a urge to drink and he went to his fridge and he did not have any any drink so he immediately got into his car and he was so it was night he just is wearing his night clothes and he he was he not even properly dressed for the outside cold weather he just went into his car he started going to the nearby bar but then when he got to the bar the particular drink that he wanted was not there the other bar was halfway across the city he got into his car and ran and drove fast but then when he was halfway through the was halfway across the distance his car fuel got over so then he was so desperate it like literally the desire is like a rope that is pulling pull 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 then he ran from there to the bar he got to the bar and he bought the drink and then just drank a sip and he said no he said i will i will savor this i put so much labor to get it i will drink it peacefully uh, and then he went back to his car by that time it had started snowing and he was walking along and suddenly he slipped in the snow and he slipped in the snow what had happened was he had not tied the put the lid of the bottle properly he just taken a sip so all the uh, all the liquor just spilled up and he fell on the ground and he had a abhishek of alcohol <laughs> <laughs> so as he was lying on the ground it is cold snow and look up there is big buildings around him all of them were dark people were sleeping and suddenly it struck him what am i doing what am i doing so i could be sleeping comfortably in this cold night on my bed in my home and here i am lying on my back in the snow bathed in alcohol that's the time it struck him i'm trapped i'm in sleep i'm not enjoying i am suffering so at that time is i have to seek help i have to get out of this so anybody who indulges they do come sometime at that realization so when they come then there those introspective moments that is the time when we can guide them and we can help them then if we connect them with krishna if we encourage them to chant if we encourage them to just connect with us and other people in general to overcome any habit it's not just a matter of will power will power is required but say if this floor is inclined in this way and then there is some expensive electronic equipment over here so we don't want water to go this way but if the floor is inclined like this and as soon as water falls on the floor water will slide this way say i don't want the water to go that way no our intention our will power is not matter it is inclined is going to go that way similarly we can say that our mental floor also gets inclined in a particular way by repeated indulgence so for an alcoholic their mental floor is inclined towards alcohol that just as, as soon as water falls the water will flow in that direction similarly as soon as they have a little idle time immediately the thoughts will go towards that thing. So it can be alcohol it can be video games it can be sports it can just be net surfing it can be a social media addiction also whatever it is 
the, when the mental floor becomes inclined like that, at that time what do you do? Three things, three R's I call it. Regulation, redirection, reconstruction. Regulation means put some bars. Put some bars so that the water won't go there. So if somebody wants to give up alcohol, then when they want to do it, create some external distance. If a person was an alcoholic and their home is next to a bar, they'll never be able to give it up. So create some distance between you and the object of interest, however it is. If somebody is too hooked to social media, just constantly checking Facebook, constantly checking Twitter, constantly and then, okay, then you know, maybe have your phone with some internet regulation, some net filter so that you can check it periodically, not constantly, whatever, regulation. Second is redirection. You know, we need some, we need some brush, we need some mop, which can push the water in the other direction. So similarly, when our thoughts are going in an unwanted direction, we need something to redirect our thoughts. So we can see, say, if this is a circle of things I like to do, and this is a circle of bhakti, find out something that overlaps. Both what I like to do and what is good also. So then to do it is easy. Like in that story of an American boy, for him it was music. He liked music and Kirtan is also part of Bhakti. So he could do that. So when his thoughts were going towards suicide, his thoughts got redirected. So redirect means get something to push the thoughts in the another direction, in the healthier direction. So each one of us is to find out what is it that will work for me. It could be music, it could be Kirtan, it could be Darshan of the deities. It could be just some reading some inspiring literature but to find out what is a redirect and then there is a reconstruction reconstruction means that when we practice bhakti regularly we become purified by that purified means those desires no longer come rather we become attached to krishna we become attached to something more positive that will take time but it will also happen so if they are to be helped then regulation, redirection, and reconstruction. The three steps by which you can help them. Okay. Thank you very much. Shri Prabhupada ki, Gaur Bhakta Vrindaki, Tai Gaur Premanandi.